talking about complaints that have been uncovered um, coming from members of the House of Lords about the quality of the Chardonnay in restaurants there, which are subsidised, and either too much or not enough salmon. We're unclear at this moment. Uh, and it, it builds into a general bad look. Broadly speaking, do you support the idea of subsidising meals for MPs, members of the House of Lords and those who dine at Westminster? I don't know. Um, good morning. I don't good know the, the specific facts of that. Um, and a lot of those issues are for the House authorities. But I think we're there to do a job. Um, I think we need to be very uh, careful. Uh, and of course, the reputation of uh, politicians of all sorts, whether it's MPs or Lords, is, is very fragile, to say the very least. And I, I know that there's a huge amount of great, important, uh, valuable work done that the vast majority of MPs, and lots of them not anywhere near the media limelight, get on with that. But I think we need to be very careful to protect the reputation and, and mm. stuff like that, uh, and particularly You've listening to those complaints. You've never complained about the wine, though, have you? <laughs> Say again? Have you ever complained about the wine? No, of course well, not. Well, there you go. All right, OK. Right. <laughs> so, not uh, your position. OK. Uh, uh, Lord Vasey and Femi, thank you so much for joining us, by the way. Um, uh, Dominic Wright, let's move on to um, probably more serious matters. Uh, so, Winston Churchill set up the European Convention of Human Rights and we look at Sir Winston Churchill as a, as a hero. Why is the Prime Minister now quoted as saying that he could be persuaded, the argument is persuasive, to even consider leaving the European Court of Human Rights. As a lawyer, I'm guessing you probably would, would disagree with Boris Johnson there. So, for, for, first of all, I think the, the job of any government is to serve the British public interest, including the right human rights framework. Um, but in relation just to Churchill, Churchill didn't set up the European Convention on Human Rights. It was negotiated uh, as very much a compromise between... But, but it, was, it was an idea by him, wasn't it, in 1950, I think? Uh, no, it was earlier than that, but it was negotiated between all the countries of Europe in the aftermath, of course, of the horrors of war. So it was, a, a, if you like, a compromise. But I don't think there's a problem with the convention itself. The challenge has been, the issue has been, the way it's interpreted. And uh, both at home under the Human Rights Act, which has been flawed in a number of respects, and, and, and also making sure that we avail ourselves of what's called the margin of appreciation. We have the right leeway uh, with the Strasbourg Court, the European Court in, in, in Strasbourg. And that's why I'll be publishing a Bill of Rights shortly to make sure we get the right interpretations. Yes, we protect our core liberties, our, our human rights, our tradition of freedom, which we're proud of in this country. But I think... And I know your viewers will feel this way. We also curb some of the abuses of human rights. The particular issue I talk about is the elastic interpretations that allow foreign national criminals to scupper deportation orders. I do think that is something we can legitimately reform. And indeed, if you look at Article 8, Paragraph 2 of the European Convention, it suggests that we've got leeway to do so. I suppose there's one argument to reforming the laws and another to potentially ignoring decisions. And as I understand it, um, the decision was to postpone any further flights until a review took place in July, which I think was going to happen anyway. What is wrong with that? Not least because no one has actually flown out there yet. It's costing money to keep putting this on. And it feels like if there is some concern, which the European Court of Human Rights have suggested that there is about the safety in Rwanda, why not postpone, sort it all out, waste less money and just listen? So, um, I'm all for listening uh, and uh, I'm, I'm the, you're quite right, the main hearing on the main substance of these issues will be decided in a few weeks' time. Uh, the issue is whether there's an injunction on the Home Secretary from proceeding with the removals. The High Court, it was Mr Justice Swift, it's well worth reading the judgment, concluded that there was no realistic risk of harm if that was done, uh, that there was uh, also a public interest, legitimate public interest in the policy of removals. This was backed up by the Court of Appeal. There was no, no grounds for appeal to the Supreme Court. And on a very, uh, uh, if, if I can say, um, flimsy basis, um, and with very little explanation, the Strasbourg Court suggested that we can't do that because of the way the Human Rights Act operate. That binds the, um, uh, the, the government. Of course, we will respect any ruling from the UK courts, but I think that's a very good specific example of something that we can change uh, with the Bill of Rights. And I would make this point. There is no power of injunction for the Strasbourg Court in the European Convention. So we should stick to it. 
But the Strasbourg court should also respect its okay. mandate. It's a two-way street. Uh, uh, Mr. Roy, can I ask you about this Rwanda policy? Why is it, when it comes to Ukrainian refugees, we say there's an online visa system that you can, you can apply to, we ask the UK people to budge up, empty your spare room and we'll pay you to house them, but for the uh, Afghanistan and Syrian refugees, we're saying we're going to send you to Rwanda. Why is it different for two sets of people? I don't think that's a, a fair characterisation. We are a big-hearted country in relation to the uh, British national overseas citizens from Hong Kong. You'll remember we've uh, opened up um, a visa system for them. Uh, you mentioned Afghanistan. We, between the period of April to August last year, there were 17,000 evacuated under Operation Pitting, but also before that. Uh, and in relation to Ukraine, I think it's 124,000 visas we've now granted. So we, we do want to be well, a safe but haven. That, but that, but you, you those... just said it yourself there, Mr. There's a huge disparity. 124,000 visas granted, online visas granted to Ukrainians. The Ukrainian war started in February. The Afghanistan war has been going for 20 years that we as Britain played our part. We conducted that war. Yet we are saying that only up to 20,000 can come here. Thousands are still in Afghanistan. The BBC today reported that 100 of them have already suffered torture. They worked in the UK embassy and they suffered torture. It seems very different for Ukrainians to Afghans and Syrians. And some will say the policy is racist, Mr Rob. Well, no, you're wrong on so many counts, I won't try and rebut each point, but let me give you the, the, the overriding response. We have shown a big-hearted approach, whether it was in relation to Hong Kong, Afghanistan, Ukraine. All the circumstances are different, not least proximity. Most refugees want to stay as close to their home as possible because they want to go back. What we, but, but the issue of Rwanda is totally different. It is about whether we have lawful routes where we uh, open up our hearts and show that great tradition, that generosity of spirit to this country, uh, but also at the same time clamp down on the illegal routes, which are the major threat to human rights because they encourage a trade in human misery. So we're saying we want but lawful if, if routes. If there was an online legal route, an online visa situation for Afghanis and Syrians, maybe they wouldn't have to rely on these traffickers, as you call them, to come here. So why can't we say the same we're doing with Ukrainians? Why can't we say, actually, yes, if you're in Afghanistan or Syria, you can apply online for a visa or you can go to an embassy in a nearby country, Pakistan, like the Ukrainians are going to Poland, and you can come here via that way. Why aren't we doing that for them? They're, they're totally different sets of circumstances, but the basic principle is we need to be able to conduct checks to, to, to check the veracity uh, of the claim, particularly to asylum. Ukrainians do those checks online and often they're not screened until they get here. So why can't we do that for the Afghanistans and, and, and Syrians? And, and we also need to make sure, and it's different depending on which country the individuals are coming from, the embassies and the high commissions we've got close, that there aren't threats to, uh, to our security. One of the things that would undermine confidence in our system is if people who wish us harm are fraudulently trying to come here. So that distinction between lawful and unlawful routes is absolutely critical. So, and, and can so I just, are, you uh, saying, are you saying the Afghanis and Syrian people are, are a risk to us more so than Ukrainians? Well, look, if you look at the so sources... What you said. Your, what's your evidence to say that they could be more of a risk than people coming from Ukraine? Sorry, you need, to, you need to listen for the answer because it's very clear and it doesn't need to be desperately long. If you look at the history and the track record of terrorism across uh, 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 these areas, clearly in Afghanistan we've got al-Qaeda and all of the um, Taliban uh, uh, challenges that we've seen over many years. If you look at um, uh, Islamic State, uh, Daesh in Syria, um, the, of course there's a, a specific set of security situation uh, of concerns which are different. But I have to say, even in relation to Ukraine, with the number of mercenaries uh, uh, flowing in to Ukraine, we also need to be careful there. But the types and the, the way you conduct those checks will differ. But let's just agree on, on two things. One, we want to have lawful routes and open our hearts to those genuinely fleeing persecution. I, I would say we've got a track record second to none in doing that. But we also need to make sure we don't encourage the trade in human misery, which is the, the real threat to human rights here, which we see with those small boats coming across the channel, which the Rwanda policy is designed to deal with. And we don't allow people to come here who would threaten just, just, our people. Just, just finally on this topic, what, 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 what have you got to say about this, these 100 men who've worked in the British Embassy, report by the BBC <laughs> that they've suffered beatings and torture, and these will be men who've been waiting for their visas, waiting for their opportunity to come here to the UK. 
Well, we, we look, I, I know because I was uh, as foreign secretary working with the defence secretary. We got 17,000 people out, British nationals, people who'd worked for us. Um, I don't know the specific cases, but we've uh, continued since our departure from Afghanistan to try and facilitate uh, the, the, those people to come here. And there's all sorts of challenges, uh, logistical, getting out of the country. But look, any and, and we also and we'll continue to do so. We also need to be clear if they if anyone is suffering mistreatment by the Taliban, the Taliban bears the primary responsibility and we're doing everything we can to facilitate uh, those coming to the UK, particularly, of course, anyone that has served the United Kingdom, whether it's our armed forces as interpreters or our, uh, the Foreign Office via the embassy. I'm sure it won't have escaped your attention that Lord Guite has resigned. Um, have you asked why a second ethics advisor has resigned and what, what answer did you get? Well, my understanding from the statement and uh, the statements number 10 have put out is that Lord Guy had been engaged uh, as recently as this week on an extension of six months. So I think uh, I'm, I'm surprised that he resigned, but I don't know the full facts. I, I know he had a pretty bruising encounter facts, with MPs because... during, during the week. Let me answer your question. Sure. Um, and I also know uh, that he was asked to advise, so getting on with the job of the, on a particularly commercially sensitive matter in the national interest. And I don't know what combination of these reasons or others uh, uh, precipitated his departure. Uh, I'm, I'm told we'll have a further update from number 10, and I suspect that will shed further clearer light on the subject. Doesn't feel good, though, does it? Um, look, I, I don't know because I don't know the answer and I don't want to speculate, but we're, we're obviously... Um, it's an important role and, and uh, uh, a successor will be found as soon as, as, soon as we can. But it, it just doesn't look great at the moment, doesn't it? They, you know, in, 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 these are people who are putting their ethics advisers to hold government to account, uh, to, to, to make sure that we can trust government. You've had two ethics advisers and they've both felt they can't do the job. That does not look good. You must admit that, Mr Rob. Well, I think it's difficult for me to comment on the second one because we don't know the grounds. And as I mentioned before, he was talking, uh, Lord Gate, uh, and I want to be very respectful because I don't know the, the precise grounds, had been talking about extending his contract for six months. So I know you're trying to say that this was all about Partygate. I don't know that that's true, but I get why you're asking the question. Um, there was a further matter he was asked to advise on. I don't know whether it's in relation to that. I can't tell you more because it's commercially sensitive. I think the fair judicious thing for me to do is allow number 10 to provide you with a further update later on today. Would you like to see that position to have more teeth, more power, and for the whole area around it to be clearer? Uh, yes, and that's why we've reinforced the powers, the authority and the resource around that position. And that was something that followed on from the Committee on Standards in Public Life and, indeed, Lord Guite's advice. OK. Dominic Raab, thank you very much for yeah, joining us this morning. Thank you.